Again, it is uh, great to be home. Well, uh, I guess at my parents' home. <laughs> Uh, it's okay. Uh, we're making progress uh, on our house, kind of. Someday we'll get in there. Someday. Uh, we've just finished another year of God's feast, and so we come back and we reflect. We think about it. Uh, we have officially rehearsed God's perfect plan for this year, uh, this year uh, 2022. What did we learn this year? What did we learn? Anything new? Not new truth, but perhaps something new about ourselves as God continues to shape and mold us. We hope so. We hope so. We hope that every one of us is making progress. And the only way to progress is to break down barriers found in our own nature. Making correction and furthering our development. Making ourselves ready for what lies ahead. Making ourselves ready for what lies ahead. As we all know, the plan of God is revealed through his feast, the Sabbaths of the eternal. Everything begins with Passover. The sacrifice of God the Father and Jesus Christ. Mr. Basie there in his sermon that was mentioning, you know, we're already looking towards that. God the Father allowing his son to be beaten, scourged, and crucified. Jesus Christ submitting himself to be beaten, scourged, and crucified. All for the purpose of opening the door to the family of God. Paying the penalty for our sins and healing us both physically and spiritually. The Feast of Unleavened Bread focuses us on the task to put sin out of our life and putting Christ in. It's not just one thing without the other. You put sin out, you put Christ in. We live a life of repentance, walking in newness of life, submitting to God, leading us all along the way. The Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost reminds us of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, the measure of God himself we receive at our baptism, which sanctifies us and sets us apart for holy service, committing our life to him, and the increasing of the fruit of God's Holy Spirit, actively demonstrating the evidence of God's character in us. The Feast of Trumpets pictures the return of Jesus Christ to this earth to execute judgment and establish his kingdom. He's bringing an end to the corruption of this world, and he's introducing himself to the people. The Day of Atonement reveals the binding of Satan, silencing his influence, and creating at one mint with God the unity we share with him forever. The Feast of Tabernacles, we just finished, pictures this new world during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of God filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. His kingdom established of which there will be no end. And finally, the last great day. Every man, woman, and child who ever lived given their first opportunity to join the family of God. All will know the eternal, and we will witness the greatest expansion of God's family in the history of the universe. No more death, no more sorrow, no more tears, and God the Father will finally join us on the earth. The kingdom established for eternity. Every piece of this emphasizes the unification between God and his children. I know I just said a whole lot. Again, the feast, it's a lot, but it's pretty simple. God, God is bringing us to himself. There's a unification, the unity between God and us. The idea that he wants to draw closer to us. He wants to be so near that we become at one and as one with him. Now, when we say as one with him, young people, that doesn't mean we become like some kind of a blob, some kind of weird being with no shape or distinction. We will be individual God beings who operate in perfect harmony, perfect love and peace with each other. One of my favorite things every year at the feast is the choir. It's almost a guarantee. We get a festival choir. And what happens? We, we blend all these individual distinct voices, a collection of sounds into the harmony of one. You take 20 or 30 individuals singing as one with each other. And that's what we're talking about. God shares all things with us, and we become of one mind and purpose in his family. And that is something on a side note that makes the... the teaching of the Trinity so dangerous. First, they make the Holy Spirit into some type of being, and then they close the door, this little triangle, this little Trinity thing, they close the door on the family of God, saying it is inclusive of them only, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and then this fake being that they make into the Holy Spirit. You can be an angel, but you can't be like God. And Satan found a way to convince the world they would always be less than him. So when we go back to the plan of God, when we rehearse these things day in and day out, whether it's every Sabbath, whether it's throughout the feasts of the year. They remind us of what he is doing, and it always goes back to that thing. 
Him bringing us to himself. He wants to be with us. There's this idea, the desire that God is bringing us to himself, getting closer to God day in and day out. Step by step, getting closer to the reality of the achievement of our goal, our eternal inheritance, eternal inheritance. Remember, again, that's the whole point. To become so close to God until we eventually become just like him. Passover. We're getting closer to God. We talk about Jesus Christ, God the Father, doing whatever it takes, that sacrifice. Unleavened bread, getting closer to God. Putting sin out of our life, making no more excuses, living a life that pleases him. Pentecost, God gives us a measure of himself. We're getting closer to God. He wants us to draw closer to him. Trumpets, literally, closer to God. Here comes Jesus Christ. Atonement, becoming at one and as one with God. Tabernacles, Jesus Christ dwelling on the earth, the world given opportunity, coming to him as he reigns on the earth, literally once again getting closer to God. Last great day, the whole world, every man, woman, child has ever lived, closer to God, an understanding. The whole thing is bringing us to him, the establishment of God's family. This can't be overlooked. And while we know these things, it's got to drive us. Every part of this, both literally and both physically and spiritually, has got to bring us back to God, everything that we do. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and look at this. We're going to start Ephesians 3 and verse 8. I hope this is clear. I hope this makes sense. The idea, the holy days, what they picture, how all of this comes together, bringing us to God, a family united, a family as one. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. Paul says here, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church, by, uh, to the principalities, or excuse me, may be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. A couple things to make note of. The desire that God has, this fellowship of understanding that he wants his people to know, this wisdom of God shared with his people that we have eternal purpose what was accomplished through Jesus Christ, that there was a goal in mind to bring us to him. He keeps forcing us back to that reality. When he says that we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, that we have boldness and access, the whole thing was to break down the barrier to get us closer to God, to give us that opportunity. He breaks it all down so that we have this access to God that was unparalleled, unprecedented. We have confidence in God's promises. Everything that he's put in this book, we trust him with it. The faith, the willing to do whatever God says, no matter what. Verse 13 says, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. This is interesting that there's an understanding of tribulations that would be taking place that the people around him didn't lose heart. They weren't discouraged by that. He says, look, trust me, this is going to be fine. Verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul is uh, recognizing his worship to the Father, bowing his knees specifically to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom, notice from whom, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This is why we say things like, your last name will be changed to God, this family of God. The whole family is named after him. The whole family. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Notice, God the Father granting us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He gives us a measure of himself so that we're strengthened, that we have this spirit, not of fear, but of courage, of, uh, of strength, of a sound mind, that God has total focus, given us that opportunity to make certain that we understand it. He says... Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, this is not just a, a weird spiritual talk. God takes this thing that beats at the center of our chest, right? It's the center of our being, the center of our body. He takes this thing, it's at our core, all the way, that Christ may dwell down to our very substance and core and being. 
through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. I mean, planted all the way down, rooted and grounded. We cannot be uprooted, cannot be tossed aside. We are rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, this is saying a lot. But the purpose that this has been revealed, this mystery, which the world does not understand. Notice he says that you may comprehend with all of the saints that we can wrap our minds around it. That we could know something so special. The width and length and depth and height. To know that which passes knowledge. That we could be filled with all the fullness of God. It brings us right back to our purpose. God's great desire. Becoming as one with him. The unification between God and his family. Everything revolves around this purpose. The reason we exist is for the expansion of God's family. All of these pieces, every step, every part of it, how important it is for us to want to be with him in the same way he wants to be with us. That we have a desire to draw closer to him in a way perhaps we've never done. What was the headline for this feast? What was your headline for this feast? What will you remember most about the feast in 2022? For me, it's a couple things. First, family. Family. There was an incredible sense of togetherness, a desire to want to be together. That is special. It's unique that people actually want to spend time together. We never get enough time. And we were at a beautiful location. We were all trying to see the sights. Sometimes we could barely make it out of the church hall. My kids think I need to uh, multitask better to see the sights and talk at the same time. I have a hard time doing that. We just didn't want to leave each other. There's not an aisle you can go down where you didn't have a conversation starting up. That's a good thing. A strength and fellowship and love for each other. Those bonds tightening. Knowing how much we need each other. And how much we're going to need each other in the years to come. There should be a very special relationship between the people of God. The brothers and sisters in Christ. The other headline. Unfortunately. Again, this is just for me. I would probably say sickness. To see so many of God's people affected by illness is significant. For the most part, nothing too serious, but certainly a challenge to our joy. It had to be some kind of record for anointings. I think about that uh, a number of the elders there spending hours of their days to go and carry out this process of anointing. Now, Mr. Munson said we've got to do better to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. Not just for one week, but 52 weeks out of the year. We have to prepare. We're talking about that even before services. I can remember years ago, uh, um, I was looking at it a few months ago, that talked about preparation going into the feast. It talked about preparation for your vehicle and checking your tires and making sure all your equipment's functioning on your vehicle, making physical preparations for the feast, planning ahead, not telling everyone on the block that you're going out of town for eight days. Uh, little things like that that they put and they shared with the people. Talked about physical health requirements, things that we should do in order to prepare ourselves. Now, again, we don't want to do this just for a week or for a month. We want to prepare ourselves. Our health and wellness should be monitored with a real emphasis on caring for this miraculous creation that we are. This body of ours, which is the temple of God's Holy Spirit, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to strengthen not just our mind, but our hearts and lungs as well. We have to. And there are ways to do that. There are physical things that we can do. We can all do better. Illness is not going away. But again, family and sickness, it's not a great combination. Once again, we're met with the same questions in our mind, or perhaps even from our children. Why has this happened? Where is God? Aren't we doing what he's asked? The world will soon be shaken, and the church has got to get prepared. If you would like a title this afternoon, it is Tested, Tried, and Counted Worthy. Tested, tried, and counted worthy. Let's go back to the book of Job. Let's go back to the book of Job. Remind ourselves once again who God is and how he operates. The title again, Tested, Tried, and Counted Worthy. We're going to start Job chapter 1. Verse 1, we're just going to read the first verse here. Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, 
And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Again, first verse, we've said this before. He establishes the context of the type of man Job was. One who feared God and shunned evil, one who was blameless and upright. Dropping down here to verse uh, 6, there was a day. Verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the eternal, and Satan also came among them. The eternal said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the eternal and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. Then the eternal said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Have you considered this servant of mine? Say, uh, so Satan answered the eternal and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Take a look here. Have you not made a hedge around him? God does that? Well, that's certain. He does. This is part of the promises of God. He mentions this in this book. Does, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? Why would God do that? Because Job was obedient. Job had done the things that he had been asked to do. Job was one who feared God. He was shunned evil. He was blameless. He was upright. He was obedient to God. And so God did what he said he would do, placing this hedge of protection around him. He also said, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. What does God say he does for obedience? Blessings. Blessings for obedience. We also know he says cursings for disobedience, which is why we don't reject what God says. Go do whatever we want. We trust God. We hold him to his promises. This is part of that. You have blessed him. But verse 11, now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. We've talked about this before. Satan's total confidence that Job was going to curse God to his face once he removed this hedge around him. Now, what does God do? No, 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 everything's fine. I don't need to test him like that. God actually allows this significant test. Why? Because God knew, even throughout the process, there was still more for Job to learn. And Job fought against his own pride, his own self-righteousness, and God was going to root that out of him. He would allow him to be tested and tried to see what was in his heart, to go all the way to the bomb, to know exactly what Job would do. The Eternal said to Satan, verse, thir verse 12, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. God was still in charge. A wonderful reminder. Keep this in mind every time you're going through something. Even though God allowed it, there were limitations. Satan was still operating under God's authority. Still operating under God's authority. He does not have free reign to do whatever he wants. It still has to be within God's reason and his authority. Now, if you drop down here, you know the story. So we're just going to go to verse 20. Take a look. Verse 20. Job arose. He tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, it's just an incredible phrase, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The eternal gave, and the eternal has taken away. Blessed be the name of the eternal. Think about that. You said do this, and he did it. He was blessed, incredible possessions. He had increase of all his goods. A special hedge of protection around him because he was a blameless and upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil. Then God removes this. Why? To test him, to try him, to make certain that he knows everything that's going on, that Job would have opportunity to learn from himself. And then he makes this statement. The total trust in God, he says, I can live with this. In all of this, verse 22, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Charge God with wrong. Does God know what he's doing? How many times have we said in the last two, three years, sickness is not going away. The trials that we experience in this life are not going away. They're going to intensify the closer and closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ. Why? To test us, to test this metal that we are being proven, that each of us are trying to overcome all that we are, to have every part of us rooted out. Anything that is wrong, that God is shaping and molding us with mercy, with patience. And we go through this process so that we can be his, just like him. Did God just want us to read this and think to ourselves, wow, good job, Job. Good job. Or was it for our admonition, for our teaching, for us to take note and understand another way that God works? 
If you look at chapter 2 and verse 3, here comes Satan again. The Eternal said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Notice the testing, the process. Job had an incredible victory. In my mind, when I look at this, that is an incredible victory. It didn't end there. This time, perhaps, we don't know how much time went through between these two trials, significant trials. But there is at least some time, because it talks about how he comes again, presents themselves again. There was a day that they came to present themselves. So there's a break, and here comes another massive test. Well, why would God do that? Wasn't it enough the first time? Didn't he get everything out of him that he needed the first time? Apparently not. Still working. God knows what he's trying to root out of Job. Have you considered, my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him, to destroy him without cause? Sure you did. You came at me, wanted me to destroy him. So Satan answered the eternal and said, well, you're right. Never mind, God. Everything's fine. Satan doesn't stop. He says, skin for skin, trust me. This is all that it's going to take. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Watch. You touch him. Just watch how fast he will turn on you. All that a man has, he will give for his life. Stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan's total confidence that if he can get at us physically, attacking even our own body, our health, our wellness, whatever it might be, that we will curse God to his face. So Satan went out from the presence of the Eternal and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Job's response. His wife comes at him. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's response, again, God knows what he's doing. And of course, God promises blessing for obedience, cursing for disobedience. But he also promises tribulation and trial. At the feast, again, just a few days ago, Mr. Munson read about Paul, the Apostle Paul, getting stoned and then Paul goes back just to tell the people, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, that's hard for us to wrap our mind around. It seems like there's something strange going on, perhaps even a contradiction. Is it blessing or cursing? Which is it, God? Where are we at? How do we explain this to our children? Or sometimes even to remind ourselves. We tell our children to do it God's way, and they'll be blessed. We go to camp, and one of the greatest things we want these young people to understand is that God's way works, and if you do it, just try him. I know Satan's going to make the world seem like everything's awesome out there, but just try him and watch. He will bless you. He will pour out his blessings abundantly. God's way works. The whole thing works. And then when we deal with difficult things, when we deal with trials and testing, we still have to explain to them that God is in charge. Our mission remains the same. Our loyalty to him, our faith in him, our trust in him, our love for him, it never changes. We never move off this line of our commitment to God, obedience to him and his commands, no matter what. We never move. There are no lines in the sand for us. I will worship God as long as Dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. Or better yet, don't. Because there shouldn't be anything in there. We talked about this at the feast. I will rejoice at the feast as long as... Dot, dot, dot. Satan attempting to rip our joy away from us. That's not going to stop. Why would he? His goal is to destroy this people that we are. The people of God. When we examine what continues to happen to the church of God right now in the modern era, there is no doubt that we are being tested. And doesn't that make sense? Why would God test stop now when things are about to get really tough in the near future? That God's going to take his foot off the pedal and say, all right, well, I hope you guys make it. 
If anything, we should be training more and more. And everybody who knows who's prepared for anything difficult, whether it be a physical task, a physical accomplishment, the training begins and you get stronger and stronger and it gets harder and harder. You begin lifting weights, you begin doing things you've never done before in your entire life and you get further and stronger. And what do you do? You don't go backwards. You say, put on more, give me more. I need to get stronger because I know what the final race is. I know what that final mark is. We gotta be so far above anything that we ourselves have even understood. A type of preparation, a type of confidence, a type of faith. And we've been saying these things for a couple of years. This is not new, but this is not going away. It's not. I remember last year, right after the feast, we went through and I pulled up statistics from 2019 from the feast site in Williamsburg before COVID, before anything else. And believe it or not, the numbers were like 759 on day one and 601 on the last great day. Almost 160 people dropped out within eight days. That was 2019. Where are we at? The church of God. Has anything changed? It's not going away. It's going to get harder. It's going to get harder and harder. Is there a line in the sand? We will rejoice. We will serve God. We will worship God as long as here. God is not allowed to cross this line. That's not the case. We go all the way no matter what. God said he would allow his people to hunger, to humble them, to test them, that he would know what was in their heart, right at the center of their being. He's going to root it out of us, whether they would obey, obey his commandments or not. And if we pass the first test, will we pass the next? And the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, until he who is about to share eternity with us knows beyond any shadow of doubt that we will never compromise obedience to him until every line in the sand is removed. The hunger and desire to draw near to God physically and spiritually has got to be there. It should be easy to fulfill the physical requirements of this. Physical, the bare minimum, showing up. It should be easy. We should never even question it in our minds what God has set up for us today. We never woke up at any point this morning. We're going, oh, am I going to church today? It didn't happen at any point in this week where we're wondering, you know, is that, am I going to go to church on Saturday? Of course we go to church on Saturday. What else are we going to do? We're going to assemble before God. That's what we've always done. That's what we will always do. We will never move. The feast. Is it possible, once again, the doubt that creeps into our minds saying, I just don't know if it's safe to gather together with God's people anymore. Perhaps. We've got to make certain that we do and we assemble where God has commanded us. And it should not be a difficult decision. It shouldn't be a decision at all. There should be no question in our minds about whether we go to church on Saturday or not, whether we go up to keep the feast of God or not. It's the very, the very thing that defines us as the people of God. Let's take a look at that in Exodus 31. Very quickly, Exodus 31. The very thing that defines us as the people of God. This symbol, this sign between God and his people. Exodus 31, we're going to verse 12. And the Eternal spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbaths, notice it's plural, he's talking about the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbaths. My Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Eternal who sanctifies you. I'm the one who sets you apart. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done six days. The seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the eternal. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Eternal made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. God says it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. This sign between him and his people. This is a sign of who we are. And it is going to get harder 
and harder to do what God has asked us to do. We are trying to get ready for the return of Jesus Christ and everything that comes along with that. We want to prove ourselves now. Now. We want to learn these lessons now. The trials, the tests that are happening now. We want to be counted worthy now. Not waiting until the very last second. We want God to know who we are today so that we don't have to go through those things that are coming tomorrow. There is still time for us to show who we are. Those who love God with every ounce of their being, faithful to the very end. We've understood for decades that the mark of the beast would emphasize a rejection of God's Sabbath. Would anything cause us to give up Holy Sabbath assembly and observance? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. The Olivet Prophecy, we've been here, I don't know, like 10,000 times. We're going to do it again. Matthew 24. We're going to start in verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus begins to give them a description of events that were going to happen. Wars and rumors of wars. Nation against nation, kingdom and kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. These things are going to happen, but the end is not yet. Not yet. These things even happen. When it talked about uh, uh, false prophets, there will be those who come in the name of Jesus Christ, saying that they, am, they are the Christ, uh, deceiving many. We knew this happened all the way back then, and it's been happening since, and there has not been the first time, the first war that was ever experienced did not happen this year. It's been going on quite some time. But God's talking about significance of these events. They will increase with intensity until we reach the climax of those events at the Great Tribulation. In verse 9, it says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Who's he talking to? His disciples. They're going to deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus Christ was hated. Hated. They sought for a reason because he said that God was his father. Remember, putting himself in that family of God, which is the same thing that we say. We're going to be full members of God's family. We become just like him. And this world will accuse us of blasphemy, just like they did with Jesus Christ. From the moment Christ said that, they sought to kill him. Christ was hated, and he said, if the world hates you, good. It hated me first. And that's what you're going to experience. Disciples of God are going to experience that in their life. There are moments we've already seen a glimpse of that. Now, it says here, many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Prior to the most devastating time in human history, I said it. Listen, I didn't say it at all the feast. The whole feast, it was all positive. We're all up here. We're back. And it's all doom and gloom. Okay? We're all back to doom and gloom. No more smiling. I'm kidding. I hope we smile. I hope we can take these things to heart. We get excited. We think about it. We got to get ready. So we got to talk about them. Not in a way where it's just despair all the time and depression. That's not why we talk about these things. And the reason we keep going back to this is because of what's coming and we've got to get ready. Prior to the most devastating time in human history, the man of sin will be revealed. The beast is going to rise to power. All of it before they officially set their mind to end the people of God. Keep in mind, the man of sin will be revealed. The beast is going to emerge. This power, this political power, joined together with this type, this false church, this false religion. They will bind themselves to one another. And under Satan's influence... They will set their mind to end the people of God. The world will look to that power as their savior and set out to destroy all and any that oppose. That's what this book tells us. 
But we see verse 15. God gives us a few things. Keep looking. We pay attention. We want to get ready. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see this spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. He stops for a second. We have this, this uh, interjection. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. We go. It says, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. The emphasis here is that you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. The abomination of desolation going to be set up again, once again, there in Jerusalem. That's what this book tells us. And it says, when we see that, a flight, a time of fleeing for God's people is at hand. So keep in mind, how far will things get by the time the beast is setting up this abomination of desolation in the holy place? Did it happen like that overnight? Like it's going to happen tomorrow? No, I don't think so. Not yet. There will be events that take place prior to that moment, which then triggers the time of fleeing for God's people and the great tribulation just around the corner. That's what this book says. It says, stop everything. Whoa, here we go. Here comes your flight. Not on the winter, or not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Then comes that time. We're going to see it. Keep in mind, we're going to still be in this world as the beast comes to power, the man of sin is revealed, you have this great false prophet and this great political power coming together, this holy Roman empire resurrected, and we'll see these events happening, and then they reach this moment of the abomination of desolation set up. Jerusalem surrounded the armies, and we flee. The people of God are given opportunity, led by God, to flee. There's a lot that takes place even right up to that moment, which then comes the most devastating time in human history. And we're trying to get through all of that. We're trying to prepare ourselves no matter what, that we will not soon be shaken in mind or troubled in heart, none of that, no matter what happens. Because between now and then, it's going to get tougher. Each and every year, it will get tougher. And if we pass this test, we better be ready to pass the next one. And it's going to get harder each time that we are tested, tried, that God has searched out our hearts, that he knows exactly what we will do when he gives us the power and glory that he shares. That eternity which he inhabits, when he hands that to his people, the thing we have just reminded ourselves of, this awesome time that we look forward to, when he hands over the keys to his kingdom, he needs to know who we are so we are tried and we are tested to humble us, to know what's going on in here. So we get this description. Let's go ahead and flip over to Revelation chapter 12. We see the abomination of desolation set up once more. Then we flee. If we're told to flee in that moment, will we have the faith, the strength to do it, knowing that we will be hunted? Knowing that we will be hunted at that time of fleeing. Knowing that the world is going to come after us. Take a look in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. Revelation 12 and verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given, notice he's persecuting the woman prior to a time of fleeing. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Can you imagine this? I mean, how, how special this moment is that God miraculously intervenes, takes his people, gives them, uh, takes, takes them away from this terrible time that is just about to happen. He miraculously protects them for this time of 42 months, this time, times, and half a time, this three and a half years. And then what happens in verse 15? So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. This flood, which we've talked about prophetically, an army coming after the people of God, the church of God. To know that we're fleeing, I, I hold in my mind, I think of a time when they come out of Egypt, 
And Pharaoh sends his army out after them. And then what happens? The waters collapse, right? Drowns the army. I mean, the parallels between these two things are interesting. But the people, they were shaken. They saw, they looked back, they saw the army. And we've joked about it. We've talked the last guy coming through, right? Just kind of pushing everybody. Go, 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 go. Look, move, move, move. What are we doing here? Let's pick up the pace. I wonder how leisurely it was when you have an army of chariots coming up behind you. Just take your time. Up front, you're just like, so glad I'm not in the back right now. Just relax, enjoying it, out for a stroll. Wow, look at the fish. This is so amazing. Guys in the back's like, move it. <laughs> Can we see these things in our mind? These parallels are not an accident. The way that this is written, looking, knowing what's coming after us, to be shaken. Would we have the strength, the confidence, the courage to keep pressing forward, to not give in to that fear that could be overwhelming? and say, you know what, you know what, fine, whatever you say, whatever, I'll do it, it's fine, I'll do whatever you want. Just protect me, just leave me, leave my kids. This, we're fine, I'm, we're not with them, fine, They're, go get them, I'll help you get them. People will do that. That's scary to think about. It's devastating to think about. So the earth, God miraculously helps them, his people, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which, uh, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And then verse 17, what happens? The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went, went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Apparently, not all of the people of God, not the entire body of Christ, not the entire church of God, there will be some who remain, some who say, I'm not ready to go yet. I can't do that. Can you imagine the call comes to flee? You say, I can't make it out my door right now. Do you know that they're coming after us? They're going door to door. The roads are all blocked. I can't make it six feet. They all know who I am. We've been going to church for the last 40 years. I can't move it from here. They're going to know what I'm doing. I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to wait it out. I'm going to see what happens. I'll flee next week. He says, you don't grab it. You just go. Just trust him. Just go. That is a lot of faith. That is unprecedented, at least in the modern day. To do it and know what is coming for you. To do and know what is coming for us. Not everyone's going to go. There will be those who just say, not yet. And what happens? The time of trial and testing continues for them. We are not getting out of testing and trial no matter what. We're test and tried now. This is a good time to go through a trial and test. To go through hard things, it's a good time because it's going to get harder. And each time, you don't want to be standing in that day, in that moment, then having to make your robe white, coming out of the great tribulation. We want to be in a different place. All of God's people have that in mind. How confident and determined we will have to be in God's miraculous protection at that moment. This is not for the faint of heart, what we are gearing up for. As the people of God... We will move forward. We will not stop, regardless of the threats around us. An army, a disease, we will not stop. Satan goes after this group that does not flee. Not all of God's people, again, will have the strength in that moment to do what God has asked them to do, to go where God has asked them to go. And some will be kept from the hour of trial. The Bible makes that very clear in Revelation 3. And some of the body of Christ will not. And so there will be further testing needed. We should dedicate ourselves to a life of repentance that we may be found worthy to escape all these things that must come to pass. He tells us, pray, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. No doubt, all of God's people around the world want to be there. Nobody wants to go through what's coming. All of the people of God and we are a collection of, body, uh, of the body of Christ, those who have God's Holy Spirit, organizations, assemblies of God, all over the earth. And no doubt, all want to be there. But they simply will not. We have to do the things that God commands now. And the leadership of the church, of God, must be emphasizing our preparation. Imagine if we're there, can you imagine if you're one of those who's there, who has been protected, who actually makes it there to the place of safety? You think we'll be high-fiving each other, knowing other members of the body of Christ are still out there in their final trial? 
Here we are, we're celebrating. I, I, don't, I don't know about that. I mean, we'll be thankful, of course. Thank God for that. But I imagine we'll be holding each other and praying as they are about to go through a terrible time. Praying that God will strengthen them. That they will overcome. That they will make it through this next trial, this next test that comes. A people of God. Many members. Many members. And we pray for one another. We love and care for each other. Those who must make their robes white, that they may be faithful to the very end. It's going to be a tough time. We have to consider every part of this. Do we have the desire for one another? Do we think of each other in that way? That we want all of God's people, we want them to be there, all of us, to overcome everything right now. I hope so. But we still have entire organizations of God's people, officially, that will not speak to each other. They won't stay that way forever. But we have to represent God. That is our responsibility, every one of us individually. The heart that God has. The same mind and perspective that God holds when he looks down from his throne. That he sees those who have God's spirit. That collectively they make up his church, his body, his family. And he tests all of us. We are tried. Put through difficult times so that we are humbled and able to demonstrate to our Creator that we will not compromise. It's a difficult thing. Everything that we have chosen, when we entered into that covenant with God, it's a tough thing. And many struggle. Every one of us has struggled to overcome who we are. And we are all at a different place, at a different moment in our relationship with God. We pray for one another. We ask God for patience and mercy, the mentality, the love that we can have. But again, we have to do our part. Every one of us individually has must make the preparations now. Let's go back to Matthew 24 just for a second here. Matthew 24 and read verse 15 again. Come with me, Matthew 24 and verse 15. We already read it. I just want to see it one more time. Matthew 24 and verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. When he said this, when Christ said this, the Jews of the first century clearly understood what this referenced. When he said the abomination of desolation, they had some context to this. Because what had already happened, historically speaking. But you and I might not have that same perspective. We might not remember or have shared the same stories. And young people, if you haven't reviewed this, we're going to do that just for a moment here today. Let's go to Daniel. When he says, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, what was Daniel the prophet talking about? What was Christ referencing here with Daniel the prophet? Let's go to Daniel. We're going to start in chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 in verse 1. Daniel's prophecy, the vision of a ram and a goat. Daniel chapter 8. And verse 1, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after those, the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. These two horns represent Media and Persia. If you don't have that in your Bible, certainly you can uh, write that. This is not uh, some crazy interpretation. You don't have to go through 15,000 different uh, books and chapters to find it. It's literally on the next page. It explains that, <laughs> but we'll come back to that in a second. Media and Persia, this ram with two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. The higher one came up last. Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward so that... No animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. This goat is a reference to Greece, the kingdom of Greece. And this horn, this notable horn, is a reference to Alexander the Great. Okay, all of this, again, 
prophesying before it happened. It's explained literally uh, through the end of this chapter. And of course, we are able to look back, historically speaking, and see how these things have been fulfilled. Verse 6 says, Then he came to the ram. This is speaking of this notable horn on this uh, empire of Greece. He came to this notable horn of the ram that had two horns, which I had been standing beside the river, had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his horn or his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he was cast him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male grew, goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Now, after the death of Alexander, his generals, his generals argued over who would take his place. Alexander died when he was very young. I, I believe he was about 30, I think he was 33. Um, but his generals, they argued who, who was going to take his place. He didn't just leave it. They didn't tell him, okay, here's who's going to rule next. So they're arguing about this. It ultimately came to... Uh, four of them managing to carve out a piece of the kingdom, a portion of the kingdom for themselves. The first was Cassander. He would take Macedonia and Greece. I'm just saying these things for context. I hope that you can go back and study. These things can be proven historically. We can go back and review all of this. Uh, you can also find it. Go through the uh, Middle East and Prophecy booklet uh, Mr. Armstrong wrote. And it talks about Cassander, Macedonia, and Greece, the oldest portion of the empire. You had Lysimachus. Lysimachus had Thrace and Bithynia, which is modern-day Turkey. He had Seleucus, uh, Seleucus, which had Syria and Babylon to the east. And then Ptolemy, which was Egypt and the southern portions toward the Arabian Peninsula. So four generals, the kingdom divided into four uh, separate regions. The empire, the empire continued with Greek religion, Greek philosophy, but was divided amongst the four generals who became king in their own right and often fought with the others for control. Now, keep in context, why did we come here? Matthew 24, Jesus Christ talks about this abomination of desolation that was set up. He says what Daniel talked about in his prophecy. So that's why we're coming here, if you guys just forgot why I'm rambling on about generals right now. Okay? There's a reason, because of the events that are about to happen. Okay? Verse 9, it says, And out of them came a little horn. Remember, the four notable ones came up toward, this is the last part of verse 8, came up toward the four winds of heaven. In verse 9, and out of them came a little horn. This little horn, which is a reference to Antiochus Epiphanes. This little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it came up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground, and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn, over to the horn, to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all of this and prospered. We do not have time to go through this prophecy in more detail, which you can look at yourself. Again, take a look at the booklet if you like, the Middle Eastern prophecy, but also in Daniel chapter 11, we have the most detailed prophecy anywhere found in the Bible. All of these details about the, the, what took place between the ram and the goat, between the four that would come after, again, one of the most detailed prophecies in the Bible. We can go back historically and find how this was fulfilled. It's really interesting. Uh, but... Again, talking here about Antiochus Epiphanes, what did he do? He stopped the sacrifices, uh, and then he himself would uh, uh, elevate himself, talking about how special he was, how powerful he was. Talking about uh, verse 13, I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one saying to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? This is where this abomination of desolation is referenced. The giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Remember here, this is looking back at an event that had already taken place when Christ references it. He also talks about Jerusalem being trampled underfoot in Revelation chapter 11 for 42 months. This is a time yet in the future. But here he's talking about a type of fulfillment that has already happened. So when we have all these details about end-time events, 
God also gives us a type of fulfillment of how they were fulfilled historically. And we should pay attention to these things. We should make note of it to see, well, what happened? What was it like at that time for the so-called people of God? What did they go through before this abomination of desolation was set up? Well, right here, again, it's talking about a length of time. The daily sacrifice is taken away. The abomination of desolation set up. It says, how long for the host to be trampled underfoot? He said to me, for 2,300 days, or in your margin there, days is not the correct translation. It should be evenings and mornings. 2,300 evenings and mornings. That's talking about the evening sacrifice and the morning sacrifice. The daily sacrifices were taken away. So how many? 2,300. Okay. So we're dividing that by two. That's why we have 2,300 evening and mornings, which gives us 1,150. 1,150 days is how long that those sacrifices would be stopped. King Antiochus sent letters by messenger to Jerusalem right after the Feast of Tabernacles in 167 BC. This is historical record. Antiochus Epiphany sent letter by messenger to Jerusalem right after the Feast of Tabernacles in 167 BC, forbidding burnt offerings, drink offerings, all offerings and sacrifices in the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes sent letters that they were to follow the laws of the land, of course, Greek culture, religion, and traditions. The people were not allowed to worship on the Sabbath or the holy days. It's interesting. We just finished the Feast of Tabernacles. I think about this moment, this letter. Could you imagine a letter being sent out that we were no longer allowed to worship on the Sabbath, the holy days? Now the abomination have not been des of desolation had not been set up yet. This happened prior to that event. Will we see something like this in our time before the great tribulation begins? In God's mercy, he will continue to test his people. On the 15th day of the ninth month, Antiochus ordered the abomination of desolation to be set up on the altar in the temple. So approximately two months from now. He built a number of altars to idols throughout the cities of Judah. Antiochus set up an idol of Jupiter Olympus in the sanctuary and rededicated the temple to Jupiter Olympus. When they found the books of the law, they burnt them, and anyone found with any part of the testament or adhering to the word, King Antiochus commanded them to be put to death. All copies of scripture were to be destroyed, and anyone found unwilling to go along with this, anyone found with a copy of the Bible, they were to be killed. You know, sometimes I think about the Holy Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, they have their own Bible. To imagine everyone, a single religion, a world empire, are they going to support anyone having their own version, other religions having their own Bible? I doubt it. On top of this, the king's officers were sent out to enforce sacrifice on the pagan altars. They were sent to enforce sacrifice on these altars. You had to go do it. You didn't get a choice to say, well, I'm, it's not really my thing, or I am super busy right now. I would totally go do that, but I can't. They were sent out, would take people, drag them. You are going to sacrifice as we have commanded you. They'd come into the city. They'd force them to pay respect to the idol on the altar and give allegiance to the false religion. This is what has already happened. Christ said, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, the people there who were hearing it, the disciples, they go, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. We need to know what he's talking about. At this time, a priest named Matthias and his sons refused. They led the Maccabean revolt over a three-year period, which would eventually restore temple worship. The temple would be cleansed and the daily sacrifices would be reinstituted. The evening and morning sacrifices would begin in the year 164 B.C. on the 25th day of the ninth month, exactly 1,150 days following Antiochus Epiphany's decree to stop the daily sacrifices following the Feast of Tabernacles in 167 B.C. To this day, the Jews celebrate this victory with the National Day of Thanksgiving each year called Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication as mentioned in John chapter 10 and verse 22. It's one of those things. It, it's actually mentioned in the Bible. Uh, perhaps you may ask yourself, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we worship? This is a national holiday for the Jews. And it's like people in Canada who don't celebrate the Day of Thanksgiving. It's a national holiday for us here in the United States. 
But let's go ahead and keep reading here in verse 15 and just kind of see what Daniel went through in this moment. Uh, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15. It happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was uh, seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Interesting. Interesting. Pointing us always to the time to come. There was a type of fulfillment of this. But the ultimate fulfillment still looks forward to a time, a time unlike any other. In verse 18, it says, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. He said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen at the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. He wants us to know what's coming. Why? Why does God always do this? The purpose of our existence is to become full members of God's family. As a father looks after his children, he's looking out for us. He's telling us, Look, Get ready for this. Here's some obstacles you're going to have to face. These are some things that are going to happen right at the time of the end. Prepare yourself. Get ready. Think about it. Make the preparations now. Verse 20 says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Well, that takes all the fun and excitement out of it, right? Yeah, he just tells us right there, Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Well, well there it is. Okay, see? The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the latter time with their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. He shall, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause... Deceit to prosper under his rule. He shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evening and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. This moment of explanation, talking about a difficult time, a terrible time, and this power that is still to come. It will rise in power. Daniel, in verse 27, look at this last part. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days after I arose and went about the king's business. Afterward, I arose. This is kind of stunning and almost shocking. He, the servant, this prophet of God, was then sick for days afterwards. He was so overwhelmed. Why wouldn't God just give him the strength to get through it? Why, why does he even have to feel that? Daniel reminded once again how physical he even is. Daniel still a physical being. Daniel fainted sick for days after what he had just experienced. And could you imagine Daniel telling God, look, no more of these visions, okay? I can't handle it. It's too hard for me to be your prophet. I can't physically endure what you're causing me to do, what you're causing me to see, what I have to go through. You can't have angels talking. I can't speak with Gabriel anymore. This is too hard. It's ludicrous. It's, it's insanity. Now, that he would draw some kind of line in the sand when it came to obedience to God, to serving God, we have to stay the course, all of us. We have to continue to do the things that God has commanded of us until our race is over, until we cross that finish line, until we rise up in the air. Again, now, we, all of these things we understand was only a type of fulfillment. History has already given us a type of the tribulation, a preview of what's to come. And we can look back at a time when sacrifices were stopped, an idol was set up. And at the time of Matthew 24, when Jesus Christ described the end time events preceding the great tribulation, everyone could already reference that time from 167 to 164 BC. What comes next for the people of God? What comes next for the people of God? We have to be faithful right now, knowing that we are being tested and proven, never yielding to worship God, to praise God, never yielding the honor and observance of God's holy Sabbaths. We want to know when these events will occur. We want to know 
when the tribulation will begin? When will the time of fleeing take place? But as we saw, when we understand the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then the tribulation will begin. A time of devastation and sorrow. God will systematically begin to cleanse the earth of rebellion, establishing his kingdom and government for all eternity. As the abomination of desolation is placed, the table is set for the great tribulation. Let's go back to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. We've already mentioned it, but we see more of the detail here as God reveals. Luke 21 an event that takes place before even the abomination of desolation is set up. Luke 21, we'll start in verse 20 where he, he talks about it right here. Luke 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Jerusalem's going to be surrounded even before the abomination is, of desolation is set up. Where do these armies come from? Just overnight? They just, oh, here we are. We're going to see a rise in power. And as the people of God, we've got to keep our eyes open to world events as they're happening. We want to make sure we're paying attention to what's happening around us. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He begins to describe that parallel, just like we read in Matthew 24. Those who are in the mountains, or Judea, flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country, enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We are trying to prepare for this. We're trying to get ready for a time when we see this rise to power. God calls us now to be pay faithful in very little that we would be faithful in much. We get another indicator here. Again, Jerusalem surrounded by armies before the abomination of desolation set up. The beast is going to rise to power. And we will see the emergence of this Holy Roman Empire again. Perhaps that rise to power has already begun. We talked about this here locally on the Feast of Trumpets. Just like to mention once again, just interesting world events. Georgia Maloney is set to become Italy's first prime minister, our first female prime minister. Her victory is not historic, or is historic not just because of her gender, but because she leads a party that is further to the right than any mainstream political movement Italy has seen since the days of former fascist leader Benito Mussolini. There's a lot of quotes around her right now. Not since World War II have we seen this type of movement. Earlier this year, she outlined her priorities in a speech to Spain's far-right Vox party. She said yes to the natural family. This is, quote, yes to the natural family, no to the LGBT lobby. Yes to sexual identity, no to gender ideology. No to Islamist violence. Yes to secure borders. No to mass migration. Her political platform, God, country, and family. Gunnar Beck, a member of the European Parliament representing Alternative for Germany, which is AFD or Alternative for Deutschland, he said, something is definitely happening from France and Italy, major European powers to Sweden. It feels as though a rejection of the manifestly failing pan European orthodoxy is taking hold among our citizens. The alternative for Germany is a far right party that became the first to be placed under surveillance by the German government since the Nazi era. At that time, the Central Council of Jews in Germany welcomed that decision by the German government, saying the AFD's destructive politics undermine our democratic institutions and discredit democracy among citizens. It says here, Europe's conservative right certainly feels like it's enjoying a revival after quite a few years. A conservative push 
with God and religion as the implied motivation behind the movement. This far right, no to abortion, no to adoption for homosexuals, no to the LGBT community, all of these things which seem to sound very religious, that seem to align with God's morality, right? God's truth. And we will see religious fervor continue to move. This far-right movement continues in governments around the world. In Sweden, they had a very similar approach. God, family, and country. But this God that they will reference is not the same God we worship. And this agenda that they will take again, we'll have this appearance of something very religious, perhaps that people all around the world can get behind, something that makes sense. Continuing on in verse 28 here in Luke 21, Luke 21, verse 28, it says, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. God wants us to look this way. He wants us to be encouraged, even though we know what's coming. In verse 29, he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. It is not coming to, as a thief in the night to God's people. It's not. There's a reason why we see these things while we're watching world events, while we're paying attention, that we're going to see a rise of this power. The church of God is going to watch it happen. Even before the tribulation begins, we will see a rise of this beast power. The man of sin is going to be revealed. Jerusalem will be surrounded. The abomination of desolation will be set up. We are going to see events and know that the kingdom of God is near. Verse 32 says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down and carousing, or with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be an unexpected event. We're to be sober, watchful, vigilant. Verse 35, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape today. Again, we are being tried and tested to see what's in our hearts and yet today, even among God's people, we are seeing a slide away from the urgency to assemble, to keep his Sabbath day holy, to keep the feast of God holy, to gather before God when God has gathered himself to us. What else should we be doing? How much harder will it get to do what God has commanded us before the return of Jesus Christ? Is it going to get easier? Will it get easier to meet with him? to gather as his people. We look at what has happened, how disease or pestilence continues to take center stage around this world. Why would Satan stop? Something that's already working. Why would Satan stop doing something that is already hindering the people of God from gathering before their God? The people are becoming more and more discouraged He's doing everything he can to make us resent the Sabbath, to make us resent the holy days. And it works. He wouldn't keep doing it if it didn't. This has continued to happen, and it's not going to go away before the return of Christ. Now is this time of trial, of testing. We're going to finish in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If we had a mission statement, I guess this would probably be it. If you look at our website, we go right here to this part of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10, but we're going to start in verse 19. And again, remind ourselves the plan of God, the purpose of God, how much God has, has put into us gathering together to him. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. 
Hebrews 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. What is that talking about? The holy of holies, this time going into the presence of God. Of course, a reference back to when the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement. But knowing that Jesus Christ has torn that veil, he's allowed access to the Father, and he tells us to go boldly to him. Well, when do we gather into the presence of God except for in his holy convocations? When we gather together on the feast days, and we gather together on the Sabbath days, he says, have the boldness to do that. Go boldly before him in the holiest by the blood. How did we get in there? What gave us access? Should we resent that? Should we forsake that? The access that we've been granted by God to him through the shed blood of his only begotten son. I really hope not. That we would ever dare to forsake what God has gone to every length to open the door on his Sabbath day and his feast days. It says here, that is his flesh, or by a new and living way, verse 20, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, when we entered into the assembly, right? We're coming into the holy convocation, the sanctuary, the holy assembly of God's people. It talks about you and I, this high priest we have over us in this household of faith, in this house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near. We don't get further and further away from him. We keep getting closer and closer. Of course, physically, physically should be the easiest way we draw near to God, going where God is, going to the place where he is. That's the easiest part of this equation. The hard part is drawing near to God spiritually, changing who we are, overcoming the sin of this world, overcoming our own sin, the flesh, overcoming Satan, overcoming this world, all of it. That's the hard part. But the physical part, this should be the easiest part of it. Drawing near to him with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That full assurance, this total assurance of faith, knowing that total confidence, without any doubt, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We never move from this principle. For he who promised is faithful. Trust him. It's why we will go to great lengths in the difficult days to come. When the whole world comes after us, we will never stop. Times when we have to gather, gather together. Thinking about that, we must be prepared to gather in a field, in a cave, on the banks of the water, wherever and whatever it takes. In a house with a mouse, in a box with a fox, here or there, anywhere, it doesn't matter. And it's an idea. This thing, how difficult it might be in the time to come. What if we can only go this far? They shut down every road. Look, I guess we can't keep the feast this year. I go back to a time, I think when I was a kid, uh, growing up in the church, and we were there in Michigan, and they canceled services because the building closed. And that's often when we cancel services because of snow, is because the library or the hotel or the community center, whatever it is, they close the doors. So what do we do? Can't go to church there. Does that mean we don't go to church? Well, if you physically can't get out of your driveway, you can't do it. You can't physically get there. However, you got two arms and you got a couple shovels, you dig yourself out and you find out, where are we going? Where's church going to be? And we get out there and we find, well, there's going to be a whole bunch gathered together at the Bidwell's house. And so we go to the Bidwell's house and who's there? As many of God's people that could gather together to be there. And they did. And we, we had services. We ate. We spent time together. We played checkers and games and whatever. We did whatever it takes. Was that traditional? Was that the normal way we do it? No. Did we forsake the assembly? No. Were those who it was impossible for them to get out? Yes. Could we gather because the local uh, authorities had shut? Well, no. They, they closed their doors on that particular building. But the people of God got out there who were able to do that. You and I have to keep these things in mind that we never stop. We do whatever it takes. We go as far as we have to. If we have to walk if we have, knowing that they've shut down our hotel or convention center, and we're going to gather in some field over here or this field over there. I've heard Todd Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, joke about it. Indiana's going to be great. Got lots of fields, lots of space. Might be a little chilly. Bring your blankets. We'll just light all their crops on fire to keep us nice and warm. <laughs> just kidding, Mr. Lawrence. I would never do that. Verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we see this day approaching, this day, the return of Jesus Christ, this time is coming. And we are to be building the strength, the courage, and the faith of God, driven by the love of God as we prepare for those days ahead. The love of God must be demonstrated by the people of God, and God defines the love that he expects of us. It's so simple. He says, for this is love that you keep my commandments. What does God tell us to do? Come to me. We draw closer to him. We draw near to him. We gather when he has gathered himself. If we physically knew that Jesus Christ would literally be in this room here today, to imagine that he's going to be here and we say, no, nah, I don't think I can make it. Or whatever else we fill in the blank with that day. We have to know that God is real. What he's doing, all these things in this book, it's coming. It's happening. And right now, we are going through moments of test and trial. It should not shock us. We should not say, what's going on? Why us? Why is this happening? The mentality of God's people, we should always be examining. Mr. Baisley brought that out. We should always be self-examining. What can we change? What can we do better? But when you know you're on solid ground, you're doing what God has commanded you to do. Like keep the Sabbath and the holy days and all those other things that God commands. We know what's coming and we have got to get ready. The feasts of God always remind us of God's plan. They remind us what we're fighting for. Step by, step, by step, we're getting closer to the achievement of our goal, again, our eternal inheritance. Every element emphasizing the unification between God and his children, a family united, every detail meant to bring us closer to him, to draw us near our creator, so near that we eventually become as one. So let's stay focused, keep smiling, rejoice, remember what we have set out to do, even in the difficult days ahead, rejoice, know what comes after, able to look beyond this immediate suffering, able to look beyond this immediate trial to a time and a day when all things will be changed. God must forever find us worthy to escape all that will come to pass and worthy to reign alongside him forever and ever. Let's get ready. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2022, Church of God Assembly. All rights reserved.